So there are many aspects of the debate that we now want to explore in the course of the next um, 30 to 40 minutes. Let's start on the North Atlantic side, so to speak, by asking about America and specifically whether we need a strong America to keep Western or Western-derived ideas of humanitarian assistance, of democracy, alive? Or is this, in fact, a false premise in the first place? I suppose one of the things that people might say is that if America is not going to provide those particular values, hypocritical and flawed, though they may, be in many, they may be in many other cases, none of the other major actors in world politics is going to provide them either. Not China, not Russia, not anyone else. But let's see what our speakers think. Eski, do we need that America flawed as it is still in the game? So, um, so you're asking, do we need a strong America for the Western uh, humanitarian and democratic ideals? My, I have a problem with this question because I would like to question the signifier Western and what do we mean by strength? So uh, when we say uh, Western for humanitarian democratic ideals, um, most such ideals um, do have a much more diverse pedigree than uh, previously thought. You know, m most of these ideals took their political form uh, during the Enlightenment period, and Enlightenment uh, was a global tide rather than being confined to the so-called West. If we were to substitute pluralist for the word Western, which I agree is a very problematic word in many ways, the idea thinking about Afghanistan and Ukraine, and one of the things that they have somewhat in common is that having emerged as polities that had a much longer history that didn't necessarily include, say, pluralist multi-party politics, the idea of civil society, the idea of having um, a media whose job it was to be dissenting and critical of those in authority, and that some recognizable aspects of all of that could be seen in Afghanistan over the last 20 years and in Ukraine over the last 30 years since um, the end of the Soviet Union. If that's the premise, could I throw that back to you and say that that is what America is being posited as potentially still necessary to maintain? But the problem is, that is not the premise. <laughs> well, it depends whose premise it is. I when mean, say it's not the, the premise, the not premise, premise of who? is that we think that America Who's is we? I mean, I mean the, 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 the common sense think that we, a strong leadership, a Western leadership, a superpower, it should police, uh, you know, and uh, show its strength uh, in place in f in to, you know, build democracies, deter bullies, but also this gives that superpower the quote-unquote legitimacy to uh, wage wars in faraway lands. That is a weakness rather than a strength. That is in that sense is not, I mean, when you say, when you ch change Western with pluralistic, it, it doesn't change uh, the common... Uh, paradigm. Is that is my problem. Is it a fatal flaw, in other words? You're saying that it the America that exists... Flaw. Okay, it's a fatal flaw. It is a fatal flaw. So, Shabnan, can I turn that to you? The fatal flaw that in Ezgi's conception has been e identified there is that America's arrogation of itself to the right to take these sorts of actions... self moral superiority. Absolutely. This means that actually the idea of America as an actor that can bring some kind of pluralism liberalism, if you want to use that word, to places and crises that exist far outside of North America simply can't be held up for any kind of, uh, of praise. No, I don't agree with that. I think when we think about Afghanistan, where post-2001, there was no infrastructure, no hospital, no roads, no education. People were living tribally. It is a very tribal, misogynistic, cultural, traditional society Sh under Shabba, Taliban rule. We need actors like the US to support nations like Afghanistan and introduce humanitarian and democratic values. The people of Afghanistan have always wanted to live equally, freely, represented by a fair government where they can help hold them to account. And we didn't have that. And although the last 20 years was far from perfect, of course, corruption, as Stefan mentioned, 
was there was widespread. There were many difficulties, but you can't expect 20 years for a country to become self-sufficient and independent. So I, the, the back to the question, I think whether it, the time is over for the US and we need to see whether there's a, a, a global coalition or whether there's a new actor in the sea, that's another question. But there needs to be countries who have the capabilities, the privilege, need to step in when needed. So with Af in, in the case of Af Afghanistan, absolutely. Shabla, just about to that, there was a period of about a decade in between the late 70s to the late 80s when another modernizing power, the Soviet Union, essentially invaded Afghanistan and brought a modernizing infrastructure there, which was secular, which brought women's education, but of course, which was run by an authoritarian society. Would you grant any validity to the modernization that was brought during that decade? No, because that was that was different, and I think it's one of the reasons why we, you know, we're opposing uh, Russia against the sort of the intervention in, in Ukraine. I think the Soviet Union had many f uh, flaws, and it's it's the the reason for its collapse. And Afghanistan, which, like I said, historically is a very very religious society. Soviet Union occupation did not work there. I think any intervention needs to acknowledge, like Stefan mentioned, you've got to acknowledge the. D division within the society it's 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 a multicultural multi-ethnic country and one of the the difficulties we had in the last 20 years in implementing a just democratic system was that we overlooked the geography the culture the dynamic the demographic uh, afghanistan has always been uh, up until 1973 a monarchy uh, it's never had uh, institutions and governance structures for the last 44 years that it's a bit that it's been in war so in a lot of these systems need to be built within i don't think uh, the the soviet union model worked uh, but i do believe that the the last 20 years with with all the flaws that it had the model did work people lived freely i traveled to afghanistan back and forth probably every year or every other year i saw how thirsty people were for freedom and for equality we brought about change and i'm not saying it was perfect any sort of intervention will come with with difficulties you've got to really understand who you're there to help what the community stands for but but intervention matters and it did matter to the people of afghanistan so with all the flaws shabir the United States in this model would still be the only superpower that has enough of that commitment to the idea of a pluralist, liberal, multicultural identity in some form to maintain that kind of system. And without America, that simply wouldn't exist. Would you agree? No, absolutely not. And I think firstly, if we can clarify, when we're talking about intervention, we're talking about the United States and its allies dropping over 300,000 bombs on Afghanistan over the space of 20 years. That is an average of 40 bombs a day for 20 years straight. Um, so, you know, it's, it's all fair to talk about intervention as a means of nation building. We are talking about the destruction of an entire country. Um, and I think when we're talking about Western values and pluralism, I think we should remind ourselves about what that actually means. And in the last 20 years, we've seen the West illegally invade and occupy countries. We've seen the West use mass aerial bombardment against civilians. We've seen the West use chemical weapons in Iraq like white phosphorus and depleted uranium. We've seen the West arm dictators like in Saudi Arabia to crush pro-democracy movements in Bahrain to destroy Yemen. Uh, we're talking about a country, uh, countries in the West where our own leaders are passing legislation now to limit our ability to protest, to give the state and the police more powers to spy on us, to infiltrate our organizations, to stop us from dissenting. Uh, these are the liberal values that we're talking about. So I don't think the US <laughs> has any kind of moral authority here to be doing these things. Quick comeback from Shabnab. Can I just say, when we talk about interventions and whether it's humanitarian, democratic or uh, liberal uh, uh, values, can we please not compare Afghanistan to uh, some of the other countries you've mentioned? Afghanistan is a very different country. It has been, it, uh, like I, exp I already described it earlier, when you talk about intervention, we need to consider the, the specific nation that we are intervening in, and Afghanistan needed intervention. It needed. It needed 300,000 bombs dropped on it. What's happening? It needed Trump's mother of all bombs dropped. But on what's it. happening in Afghanistan with the Taliban killing people, suicide attacks? It's fine. Well, in the, the Taliban, the US we're gonna, was we're supposed to remove, who are now stronger than they were. What's <laughs> so it? Put, 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 put a hold for a second. We're going to get some more voices, then bring it in. But, but it, there's going to be plenty more to debate. <laughs> Stefan, please. Well, you look. I think 
an important distinction has to be made, you know, like I definitely would be very strongly d uh, supportive of, of the idea of, of liberal values, liberal order, and there is some values there definitely in it. But of course, where the problem lies is that in often when we do interventions, and I've seen it working inside governance well, governments as well, this becomes just the narrative, and unfortunately not an, uh, the narrative rather than actually the real true driver of it. When it becomes geopolitically driven, you get an awful lot of this collateral damage that is actually not taken. So my point would actually be, there are certain bits in, in these societies, and definitely uh, in, in the early notice in Afghanistan, you know, there was a case for trying to do something. The point that we have to be very careful with, with all these interventions is that are we risking making it far worse than far, uh, or making it better? There is a tendency to assume that the interventions will make it better and that we actually can We're establish not assuming, this kind of thing. It's evident. Well, it's I'm not afraid that actually in Afghanistan we undermined actually the emergence of a stable state because we, we made actually those actors that were in charge of the state, um, it, it was in an increasingly more corrupt country, it was increasingly more run by. by by actually financial means often aid fueling it, at some point it becomes unsustainable. So, so we made a lot of errors by being in a hurry, by thinking, oh, quick fixes can be doing it. And actually by the time of the fall of Kabul, it wasn't sustainable anymore. It was already for years clear that actually that wasn't the way to do. So it's a lot to do with the way we do it rather than maybe the principle that there are values that are worth defending. Can I bring Esri back in? Yes, um, I, I understand Shebnam's point of uh, view about education education, infrastructure, but this, uh, this is pure colonialism. I mean, when you look at um, <laughs> Egypt under uh, Britain, British uh, rule, I mean, when you look at Algeria, when you look at Tunisia, uh, when you look at Morocco, when they left, there was an intact administration. I mean, but they changed the whole um, uh, society and the whole uh, establishment in their colonial mindset and we we now see uh, the uh, post-colonial calamities going still on today I mean uh, I I understand uh, uh, that Afghanistan is different but there are something some things that we should understand when we think United States when we think United States as a, you know, a humanitarian, democratic, you, you know, there are, uh, there are 18 uh, human rights treaties, international treaties, and U.S. is only party to five. And ratifying an international treaty requires two-thirds of the Senate, and which means that it will not change anytime soon. And what, what, and coming up on Stefan's point, I think the whole point of these interventions and democracy promotion is based on the transition paradigm, which were, were led by American policy advisors. And this paradigm goes like this. There comes the collapse, the collapse of the authoritarian regime, taken by an external uh, actor or uh, people like what we have seen in the post-Arab uprising. Then. The, the paradigm assumes, a rapid democratization uh, starts with a new government through national elections and then uh, a promulgation of a new constitution and hence the democratic institution. Th a whole generation of uh, democracy aid community were led by this uh, transition and only a few examples are shown to work. This is Le not working. So let's take that point and use it to move on to something that is now of great relevance in the here and now, moving on from that. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.